Welcome to episode 161 of the Ski Podcast, and thanks for joining us, listener. Today, we have a ski boot special. We're going to be looking at the types of boots on offer, how you should choose one, whether you should have them fitted or molded as well, and some of the gadgets that work with them. My name is Ian Martin. I would like to introduce my guest today. I'm delighted to welcome uh, one of the UK's best boot fitters, Colin Martin from Solutions for Feet. First time on the podcast, Colin. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, Ian. All ready to go for a rocking season. Excellent. Where where are you today? I'm actually sat in my wife's office because it's the quietest place that I could go. If I'm in the shop, there would be the phone going, there'd be people banging around, the workshop tools would be running. So I have stolen her office for for this time. Excellent. I appreciate that. And and solutions for free are in Bicester, is that right? We are in Bicester, yes. Town centre yeah. Bicester, not at the village. We couldn't afford to be there. <laughs> okay, excellent. And my second guest today is a regular guest. Uh, listeners, long-time listeners will know his voice uh, very well. Our equipment uh, expert, Al Morgan from SkikitInfo.com. Uh, Hi, Al. How are you going? Morning, Ian. I am good. And you know what? I am really excited to be having this conversation today. So, yeah, bring it on. Excellent. Well, you know, we only probably have uh, an hour for the whole podcast and we have a huge amount of knowledge available today. So I'm going to uh, do my best, but I will ask uh, uh, my regular question, my regular starter, which is when were you last uh, on snow? And I'm going to start uh, with Colin uh, with that. Last on snow would have been the industry ski test in Kutai last year. I then took a little trip over to Caprun and got hit by the dreaded Rona. So I uh, ah. spent 10 days staring at a mountain instead of skiing on it. Okay, not ideal, but uh, you did get some uh, skiing in. And Al, I'm guessing the last time you were on snow was probably indoors. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely right. I'm really lucky I'm close to Hemel Snow Centre. So, yeah, that was my last slide. Okay, well, um, I haven't been uh, skiing for quite some time now. April, I think, back in Ladies Alp. But I will be going out, uh, hopefully, next month uh, to Val in uh, Le trois Valais. And uh, listeners may know that the ski podcast is sponsored by Le trois Valais, which is the largest ski area in the world. It's uh, 50 years uh, since the opening of Val in 1972. And uh, hopefully, if things go well, they'll be opening for this season in another week's time. So we're going to be uh, covering that. And hopefully um, we're going to have uh, uh, Alex Irwin uh, on the show to give us a snow report from there on the next podcast. Now, just a quick update on uh, news. Team GB, there have been a few World Cup races that have been uh, cancelled. Unfortunately, the Solden Women's Race and uh, Zermatt Downhills were cancelled. I mentioned the big air in Kerr, which is the correct uh, pronunciation. And that was great to see that Mia Brooks uh, took ninth. That's a, it's her first year in the World Cup circuit. And Kirsty Muir on the skiing side of things took seventh. So that's a really nice start there. While I said that Alex will hopefully report from VT uh, next week, I do have a snow report already, which is from Robin Shah, who's in Verbier uh, last weekend and went ski touring. And so he sent us in this. Hey, Ian. Greetings from Verbier. I'm up here at Attila, 2,700 metres. We've had about 15 centimetres of natural snow and the cannons are going full blast all the way up from Ruinet at 2,200 metres. The mountains are white, the, the sun's shining. Oh, it really looks fantastic. Uh, with these cannons blowing, I've got a sneaking suspicion they must be preparing to open for next weekend. Uh, it's getting a bit warmer this week, but I think there's another top up forecast for Thursday or Friday. So keep your fingers crossed. And hey, here's for a great 22-23 season. Cheers, bye. You may have noticed there, he thought that possibly Verbier were gearing up for opening this weekend. And in fact, the day we're recording this today, Friday the 11th of November, Verbier have announced they're going to open early for today and then every weekend through November through to the 3rd of December when they have their official opening, which is quite exciting as well. And as a last minute bonus, we have a second snow report from regular contributor Dave Burrows, who was out in Glacier 3000 in Switzerland this weekend. Hello, Ian. It's Dave Burrows from Snow Pro Ski School, based here in Switzerland. Uh, today, I am skiing Glacier 3000. Uh, Glacier 3000 opened yesterday, so I missed the opening day, but I got the first lift on the second day, which I'm pretty pleased of. Now, given how dry 
this summer has been i am absolutely astounded by how much snow there is up here and what amazing condition the pieces are in it's really really good the snow is beautiful it's cold uh proper glacier snow you know um cold and grippy so i'm gonna have a lovely time here i'm lone wolfing today no one else with me and um yeah if you get a chance get yourself up here because it's really really good uh glacier 3000 is included of course on the magic pass um so i'm expecting it to be reasonably busy on this sort of sunny saturday anyway hope you're doing well uh ian great work you're doing with the podcast keep it up um it's a valuable resource for everybody uh see you soon bye Thanks so much for that, Dave. That's brilliant to hear his voice on the podcast again. Now, one more bit of news. The 73rd uh, annual Warren Miller Ski and Snowboard movie, Daymaker, is starting soon on its UK tour. Uh, The first date will be Glasgow on the 21st of November, and then it will be travelling around the UK. This is a great way to get excited about the uh, season. Uh, uh, I'll put a link into the show notes so you can see where it's going to be when. Uh, I will be hosting the day in Brighton on Friday, the 2nd of December, so if anyone wants to come along uh, please do so but otherwise um have a look at the link and uh, snap up your tickets for this great way to warm up for the season now let's move on to the the main issue of the day which is ski boots and we've touched on uh, some of these points before uh, episode 90 is uh, one reference but i wonder if we could just start off colin you've not been on the show before give us a, a little bit of your background you're obviously running solutions for feet just now uh, but when we were chatting in the green room earlier, you've been working with ski boots and in the ski industry for a long time. Started this was a, a Saturday job, and uh, in 1986, I started working in Nevisport in Glasgow, and working in the workshop, and did a little bit of boot fitting. What well, well, if you could call it boot fitting back then? You know, it was pretty rudimentary tools and very basic uh, molding insoles. And my full-time job as a carpenter just fell apart in 1991. So I came back into the industry on a full-time basis. I was on the team that opened Snowdome and Tamworth, running their tech side. Uh, then did nine years at Lockwoods and Leamington Spa, running their boot room. Until 2005, when I uh, opened Solutions for Feet. That's yeah, so 17, you know, 17 and a bit years of uh, trying to make it go just as a ski boot only store. Well, uh, I think that you've probably uh, done very well because a lot of businesses like that don't uh, get beyond, uh, you know, one year, let alone uh, 17 years. And you have a reputation that uh, precedes you through the industry there. Um, Al, what about yourself? Could I ask you? I know we've sort of discussed this before, but how did you get into the, the, the ski boot side of things? Because apart from being a general expert about all sorts of elements of ski equipment, you are a specialist on ski boots uh, itself, aren't you? Yeah, you know, it's it's a really, possibly a geeky thing, but it's essential for skiing, isn't it? Being in a good ski boot, it makes a massive difference to your skiing. But yeah, my background, I actually worked out in the Alps for a British tour operator. We had a rental operation. It was in the heady days when you could lead people about the mountain without any qualification as mad as that might seem now so yeah that was a pretty good time and then I um so running a rental center out there and a service center and then I came back and worked in retail in London doing a very similar role and uh, you know a, a bit like Colin to, to a lesser extent in that I kind of worked my way up through the ranks but I've always had a, a, a passion for this side of skiing skis are sexy everybody talks about skis but way more people Mm. buy boots and we all know people who've had boot problems so uh yeah hopefully today we can help people you make a very good point there a ski boot to me is much more important than skis and i have my own ski boots but i don't i haven't had skis now for a long time and part of that is because it's a pain to uh, ship your uh, skis over with you uh, to the alps if you're flying it costs you extra money and i tend to travel by train quite a lot and it's a bit more uh, cumbersome but your boots are much more important that fit around your boots and i wonder if we could just start off with some of the jargon because we're going to just a lot of these words are going to crop up in our conversation so i wondered if we could uh, cover these now and uh, i'll start with you colin wonder if we could just go through a couple of things like the cuff what is the cuff for example the cuff of the ski boot that's the top part of the ski boot so if you if you actually but it's easiest to start at the bottom or and split it into three parts okay so you have the shell of the lower of the ski boot which we would know in the trade as the clog so that's the lower part the part that wraps around your foot the cuff is the plastic section that goes around your leg and then you have the liner, which is a soft padded bit, which goes inside of the hard plastic shell. The bit that gives you the, well, it's meant to give you the comfort. Right. Okay. And then 
within so all ski boots have those elements but then they have different aspects to them uh, themselves such as flex and last what, what do those things okay, mean okay <laughs> so the, the, the i think the really important thing the last comes first there we go <laughs> bit contradictory <laughs> the last okay. the last people refer to the last as the width it's the width of the ski boot it's a cobbler's term the last of a shoe so if you've ever seen the old wooden block that a shoe is made on a ski boot starts life very much like that but it's not now it's no longer wooden a lot of the time they they start with an, the inner shape or the foot shape they'll lay little cork tiles by hand onto that to create the shape that they want for the inside of the shell, and then they'll build the boot around that. So this is basically the mold-making process. So your last is, when, when people talk about last and ski boots, what it actually refers to is the physical width of the forefoot, but only in a size 26.5 ski boot. That's the reference size. Every, t- every time we go up or down the size, we go up or down two millimeters in width. So people people often come to me and say, I need a, an, a, a, a I need a hundred millimeter last. And then you look at their foot and go, Well, you might have needed a hundred millimeter last if you were a size 26, but you're a size 27. So a 98 millimeter lasted boot is actually a hundred in that size in the 27. Okay. And I mean, I think already that's starting to sound a little technical. And this is a reason why it makes sense to go and see someone who knows what <laughs> they're talking why I have about. A Exactly. Because, uh, Al, if I could come to you then, I mean, recently, you know, we've been discussing Mondo Point and Colin referred to 26.5 there. Yeah. Is that a Mondo Point number? Is that what we're yeah, talking about? Yeah. So, Mon- just think of it the easiest way for me is the centimeter sole length of your foot. But what's is it essential? It's really important to understand a 26 we'll, we'll stick with the reference size because that's the reference shell size for most brands the vast majority a 26 and a 26.5 is the same boot they don't <laughs> have you know if you go from a 22 up to a 30 size shell there's not a different size plastic for every half size that would be inordinately expensive it's expensive anyway to make a mold unbelievably expensive so there's other ways that we can get a boot to fit but a 26 and a 26.5 is the same size. Often now brands have put a spacer in the box and we can push, lift the foot a little bit to take out volume. Right, that Mondo point is the centimetre sole length. So you know, when foot. people are, right, when people are, you know, understand their regular shoe size, a, a, a boot fitter or a ski, or a, a, a retailer is going to help them convert that. I, I think it's really, really important to, to understand is the, the Mondo point size conversion charts is one of the few things in the world that should be expunged from the internet. <laughs> it is so far out, it is unbelievable. Because right. it, what it does is it tries to take a, a European or a UK size, which is an imperial measurement, one third of an inch being a size, 8.2 millimetres, and it tries to convert that to a 10 millimeter per size metric system. And it also tries to tell you that a size, I'll use 24 uh, 24.0 is a size 5 UK, 24.5 is a 5.5 UK. But we've just had the discussion that 24 and 24.5 are the same boots. So how can they be two different sizes? So if you if you sort of extrapolate that out, I, I ski, I measure a size 11 on a UK measure, I measure a size 11, I buy a size 11 shoe, my ski boot is a 28 slash 28.5 shell, which is marked on the conversion as a 9 or 9.5. So, so the simple answer uh, to this then is go and see a professional who's going to find out the right thing. So one other uh, kind of question now, I'll uh, ask Al about this one. What about flex? What are we talking about here? Is it as obvious as it sounds? I can see Colin smiling. I love the flex conversation because uh, it's a relatively modern concept in that when you are looking at ski boots as a consumer, you kind of want to know which boot roughly is going to work for your skiing your build your your energy and so so flex gives us an indication of how much support you get out of a boot um so a higher number in in retail boots is generally 130 is a more support of a stiffer more generally thought of as a more powerful boot and then we're going down you know even down as low as 65 for for, for adult boots but generally you're looking at somewhere around a 70 or 80 but a 120 flex boot let's pick salmon for for example if you pick a different 
book model all at 120 from Salomon, they will all feel different. And then you look at different brands and then those flex will, will feel different. So it's not standardized. In a room, the plastic is warm, so it's softer and will flex more. In the deep midwinter when it's bitterly cold, the boot will feel much stiffer. But it gives you an idea of where in a range you may be looking. Okay. And I would assume, am I right in saying that, uh, you know, a, a flex of 130, something that's stiffer, is more suited to stronger skiers and the lower numbers, uh, you know, at the other end of the range? Is, is that right? To, to some degree, if you've got a really light but strong skier, then they would be in a different flex boot to somebody who's a really heavy but strong skier. And conversely, you, you've got, Colin knows way more about this than me, but you've got bioma- biomechanical issues that come in here. And some people may benefit from having a stiffer boot or a softer boot, depending on how their ankle you know, moves, what mobility they've got. There's, there's so many factors in it. And I'm not going to keep saying the point, but this is why people like Colin have a job because it's a very complex subject. Okay, excellent. Right, I've got one more um, item on my jargon list, and those are insoles. Uh, Colin, you mentioned about the liner. You know, the boot comes, uh, you know, with a liner, but you have insoles as well. How does that fit in? To Absolutely. The, uh, so the insole that the manufacturer provides is nothing more than what we call a sock liner. It's a piece of carpet tile. It's the cheapest. Some of them try actually spending money on this to... Uh, make something which feels relatively comfortable because at the end of the day, boot manufacturers want to sell ski boots. So the boot has to be comfortable out the box. So it's that initial feeling when you go in, that softer, squishy feeling is what they're trying to achieve because let's be honest, they're they're in business. Uh, Their business is selling boots. Our business is making those boots comfortable or make them perform as they should. So Every single time that we're working on the ski boot, that piece of carpet tile is, I'm afraid, destined for the bin. If you want to use it as a packer in your wellies, that's absolutely fine, but it is going out your ski boot, (laughs) and we'll replace that with a custom-made insole, or at very least an off-the-shelf insole, but most of our business is is custom. We don't do much off the peg. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll come back to uh, insoles as well, where that's really useful. Right, okay, that's a a bunch of the uh, jargon. There are a couple of other questions in relation to the different types of ski boots that you can have, just to give us more context behind the conversation. In my mind, there's three broad categories, which would be alpine boots, hike and ride boots, and touring boots. Does that sound right, Colin? Yeah, I would would split them into that. You can subcategorize those, but generally, alpine boots, fixed cuff, bolted in the in the spine tend to be slightly stiffer therefore alpine skiing what people what would people traditionally talk about skiing your touring boots on the other end of the scale they are more lightweight the people that started this were the climbers that wanted to access routes that were snow covered so they're much much lighter you know, down to less than a kilo per boot and those are designed for the up but maybe don't ski as well and then you've got the hike and ride, as you call them, what we call the hybrid boots now. They're free ride touring. They're alpine boots with a touring facility. So they have the pin inserts and they have the hike mode that allows a good range of motion now. And every brand is making, I would say, a, a really strong contender in there, in that marketplace. And those are the boots that if you were sort of unsure about what you wanted to do, you want to do more off piece, maybe try touring. That's a direction you can certainly look. It does limit your options a tiny little bit in terms of number of lasts, number of different shapes available. But for the most part, there's there's something out there with an Alpine equivalent. Because it's always good to try and help, you know, we're talking with terms, but with boots, I think the things that is worth knowing, and it's slightly confusing, a downhill boot, as I think of it, because it's easier to think of it that way, is technically called an Alpine boot. A touring boot is called an Alpine touring boot. Seems a bit daft because all of these boots are for the Alpine environment, really. But yeah, so just don't get confused between Alpine Touring and Alpine. They are separate categories of boots. Okay. And you know what you mentioned there, Colin, about the the mix, hike and ride. I'm 
hoping to get hold of a, a pair of a, a, what you might call hike and ride boots because I, I've tended over the last few years to graduate much more to ski touring. I pretty much ski tour on every trip that I go on now. I might not be ski touring every day, but if I have those boots, then I have the uh, the kind of uh, a facility at the front of the boot to just clip into any ski touring skis because I, I have that uh, the, the pins at the front. So it gives you that best of both worlds. Do you lose any alpine or downhill performance? Possibly a little bit, but I really think you you only start to notice that if you're on a high performance race ski where you need the lateral stability of the boot to drive the ski. But in general terms, most people all mountain ski wouldn't notice the difference. Okay, excellent. Right. So we're talking about ski boots. Let's say, you know, a listener has decided that on the type of boot that they're uh, looking for, here's your big question. How should they choose that that right boot uh you know when they're making the next step colin what would your uh, what would your advice be and i appreciate you work in a business where you sell ski boots but okay. uh, you know if you can if can you view that impartially impartially i mean the, the real thing with ski boots is it's a bit like harry potter and his wand you know the one chooses the wizard the, the ski boot chooses your foot so that's the, the guidance that you get from a boot fitter wherever they may be that's really their job is to guide you towards the right product in terms of shape for your foot, flex for your body weight and your skier level, what's going to work best for you. The other way you do it is you try on 150 different boots and loads of different shops and you confuse yourself <laughs> and inevitably end up with a boot which is a size too big. Yeah, you need to have that trust, uh, I think, don't you, with, uh, yeah. with whoever it is that you're speaking to. Um, Al, uh, thoughts on this? Fit is king. And I write about this for, for, for various media, quite a bit about boots. As I say, I'm really into ski boots. And fit is absolutely king. But actually, a, a second second to that, I often say, you know, look at what you need in the boot. But that often comes first, a bit like Colin said, last is first before. Um So you do want a boot that's going to meet your needs. So if you think you're going to do a bit of touring or you might want to do that in the future, then, yes, absolutely look at something that has that function on it. You can still tour in an alpine boot, and I've done loads of touring in kind of a race-style boot. I wouldn't advise it for everybody, but you can do it. So if you get into it, down the line you can do it. But have a look at the functions on the, or the kind of boot that you want and have that conversation with your boot fitter. Yeah, I mean, just on that point about uh, being able to ski tour uh, in an alpine uh, boot, uh, I went out to Morocco and did some ski touring a few years ago, and I had uh, specific ski touring boots, and my brother had alpine boots, and it was a lot harder for him, you know, because you're having to, um, you've got a heavier uh, binding on the ski, haven't you? So yeah. that that makes a, a lot of difference. The whole setup's uh, heavier, the boot and the binding. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But okay. You, you go to a fitter to try and find the right boot. The ski boot chooses uh, your foot. Here's a question for you. Some boots obviously cost more than others. What are you getting for that extra money? You know, do you, if you spend that extra money, what, what's the, the return for that? You don't always need to spend loads of money. If you are a new to skiing, there is no point in you spending six or 700 pounds on the best, stiffest, tightest ski boot. You are going to massively sacrifice everything to do with skiing and all that's great about it, and it'll be terrible. So it needs to be appropriate. I think that's super important to know. But as you develop and you progress in your skiing, then you may be looking for other things. The plastics can be more expensive. The way that they, they shape it and make it, a lot of it, the liner is a lot more expensive to make. It has different foams, stiffer foams. You have different moldable areas in it. So it's generally to do with trying to deliver performance. And if we look at cars, we get Formula One cars. They're amazing. And that technology filters down to a retail car, but generally into the more expensive cars. And it's a similar thing with all kinds of kits. So that top-end ski boots will get bits that are designed typically on the race circuit now that's not, not just downhill racing it could be ski tour racing and then it comes into the boots that way but yeah you, get, you generally get more expensive materials they can often be lighter they have to give you that support even though they might be lighter and a good proportion of it comes down to the liners 100 percent agree you uh you don't want to, as if you just passed your driving test and we handed you the keys to a formula one car the chances of you making it around the streets <laughs> of uh 
Brighton or Birmingham, wherever, <laughs> is pretty slim. Yeah, so it's finding the appropriate level of boot for the skier. Uh, as the price goes up, it is material costs. The the, the stronger plastics or uh, better quality plastics and more it's more liner. I think is a bigger proportion at that at that level. When you go the the difference, you know, generally between a one twenty flex boot and a one thirty flex boot is often slightly stiffer plastic and generally mostly in the liner. Al? And the, another thing to note: the reason why the this modern free ride touring boot or a touring boot is so expensive, those little bits of metal at the front and the back that you step into a pin binding are unbelievably expensive. You will not understand how expensive they are to make. And that's why a free ride touring boot is at the upper price point. There okay. is also a patent paid to Dinafit. In fact, I believe it might be. I'm not, I need to I need to clarify this 100%, but it's a Dinafit insert, which I think Dinafit pay a patent to Roxa or somebody like that. So it's a, it's a big chain of events that uh, costs you the extra bit of money. Right, that's really interesting. Now, can I move on to uh, to fitting? You know, we've 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 referred and touched on uh, uh, fitting a, a few times already, and we're saying you know you go in to see someone who knows about ski boots, a ski boot professional who's going to guide you in the right direction. But a fitting itself, what can you expect if you do visit a boot fitter specifically, rather than just perhaps someone who's going to sell you a ski boot? Is that boot fitter versus boot seller, as you say? So for us, we we probably take it a little bit more extreme than most places, but we start with an assessment of your biomechanics, measurement of your foot. So I want to know how the joints of your foot interact, how they flex, your level of flexibility in both your foot and your ankle joint, because that's critical in skiing. We're going to take a load of crucial measurements, and that will be the length of your foot, the width of your foot. And an interesting measurement called heel and step perimeter that most people forget about, which is essentially the diagonal measurement around your instep to your heel. And that from that, we then start selecting shells. Now, we have 60 plus boots on our wall. And out of that, for most people that walk into the store, there will be two or three shapes that will work. Maybe two, let's say two shapes that will work well. And then you have flex options within those shapes. So lighter and more uh, recreational skier against a more aggressive skier. So we might have the boot in a 110 flex and the 130 or a, an 80 flex and the 110. From there, we'll be done a try on the very first thing to say, we'll do a shell sizing and we'll try the boot on. When you put your foot into a new ski boot, which is being fitted, the very first thing you will say is it's too small every single person so we warn them your toes are going to hit the front of this boot we're going to clip the boot up correctly now that's the critical part as well how you clip the boot up when we do that and you've worn the liner up of the boot the material starts to soften your foot starts to settle into it five ten minutes and all of a sudden that boot that felt too small starts to feel more doable then we move on to building insoles and modifying and heating and stretching and doing whatever needs to be done to to shape the boot to you you know you've mentioned that that next stage i mean a lot of for a lot of people oh molded ski boots means lots of different things so the, the, there are two essentially there are three moldable parts to a ski boot you've got the insole the foot bed or the orthotic whatever you want to call it you have the liner or the inner boots and you have the shell so contrary to popular belief all shells are moldable they're made of polyurethane they're made of polyamide polyamide and polyurethane are moldable plastics how they are moldable, on the other hand, is slightly different. And the liners are moldable in terms of the foams can soften and conform. They don't shape 100% around your foot. They conform more to your foot. They stretch, they give, they pack down. But what's also really important to understand is just because it says uh, it is a custom shell of some description from brand X, Y, or Z, if the shell, just because the shell is custom moldable doesn't mean you put the shell in the oven every time. There is no cookie cutter approach to this. Everybody is different. So if you have somebody that's foot is just a little bit wide for the boot overall, but not, not crushing, but just a little bit wider than they, they would feel comfortable with, then we may heat the shell to create space. If their foot's within the width of the shell and not feeling too tight, 
the last thing we want to do is heat the boot and create space because it will create space in other areas like round the heel and the ankle, which is the driving areas of the boot. Yeah, and I think you know what I'm going to—it's a little self-indulgent this, but I have this experience a lot. I've, I've skied in a lot of ski boots. I'm re really fortunate position, and I fit the boots. I will ski them all out the box and see what they're like. And of those that have a heat moldable shell, if you imagine my foot, you put me in a medium last the boot. The majority of people would, but I much prefer a snug hold right around my foot. It's just what I like in a ski boot because we all have different sensations. We all have different appetite for pressure, and, and you know, and that's why there's not a, a one size fits all approach. And for me, if I heat a shell, I go for narrow lasted shells, which you probably wouldn't fit me in. But if I heat it, I don't like the skiing experience. I find it's too big. So, yeah. yeah. And as Colin says, it is all unique and tailored. One thing that's worth clarifying, when Colin's talking about we heat the shell, yet earlier on we sp said that there's a cuff and a shell. This is where it gets slightly confusing. When we're talking about heating a shell, we're talking about the whole thing, the upper and lower part of the boot. And this is like, like Colin and I often talk about a clog and a cuff because then we know which is we're talking about a lower part and an upper part. But yeah, shell is an interchangeable term. Sometimes it means the whole boot outside and sometimes it just means the lower part. The current pair of boots uh, I got were from Profeet uh, in southwest London. And they were, uh, you know, molded for me slightly. They're actually fitted by Janine Winter, who I'm sure you uh, probably both know. She's not working there uh, anymore. She's working over in uh, in Caprun now. It was an exceptionally good fitting and service. And I took them away, used them for a bit, and we kind of established that they needed to be the the shell needed to be manipulated slightly. And I watched them do it, and they kind of heated it up, eased it out a little bit, uh, and it made so much uh, so much difference. Um, but I realise now what I was talking about before, moulding. I was thinking about foam-injected liners. You do get those, don't you, where you can – is that something a consumer could do or is that always going to be dealt with by a, a ski boot professional? Very much going to be done in the store unless you want a horrible mess. <laughs> it's, uh, you're dealing with – foam-injected liners are a, they're an interesting subject and it's not something we do a massive amount of these days. We do some uh, low-pressure foam liners – there's, there's various schools of thought about foam injection. It's a great system for some people. Mm -hmm. I think that's it is for some people. And the worst person you can ever do a foam liner for is somebody who had a good foam liner that really liked it because whatever you do the next time will not be the same. That is a super valid point. I've had a few foam liners done and some of them are horrendous and some of them are brilliant. And this comes down to many factors. You know, the fact that you're mixing different chemicals together What's the temperature of the room you're in? What's the humidity like? All of this can play a part. When I used to fit ski boots professionally a long time ago, for performance skis, a, a foam injected liner was a really good solution. But since that time, this is a long time ago, since that time, stock liners have improved so very much that actually we can get an amazing fit, performance, hold, and comfort without having to go down that route. And then there's other developments that we're seeing in the foam injection world deal with the other end of the spectrum that, that, that it's a bit hit and miss. They're making a, giving a far more uniform result, which is great. But yeah, stock liners now are so much better. Excellent. Well, we talk about customizations of, of the boot, and I mentioned Profeet. I have custom insoles for... All of my running shoes, uh, regular listeners will know I've done quite a lot of uh, long distance running in the Alps and in the UK as well. And I, I think, you know, it's hard to say, I haven't had many injuries. It's made a lot of difference. I also have uh, custom insoles for my ski boots as well, which were created by Janine when I went into uh, Profeet. And you alluded to this uh, earlier, Colin. This is something that you do. The actual insole that you get from the manufacturer isn't really designed it's just designed to be comfy rather than be supportive to the individual skier so i wondered how much difference it makes and how you go about creating those for a customer okay so as far as we're concerned it is the foundation you wouldn't build a house without a foundation we wouldn't fit a ski boot without a foundation or without a footbed but the critical thing because i know you've probably spoken to some people there's a few people in the world that uh, are completely anti-footbed and there are a few people that like certain types of footbed. The key, I think, for a good boot fitter is to have different materials to be able to make different types of footbed for each individual foot. So we make three different manufacturer's products 
and we can make them in three different ways. We can make a non-weight bearing insole from Superfeet. We can make a semi-weight bearing insole from Instaprint or Masterfit. And we can make a CDAS product, which is either made semi-weight bearing or, or weight bearing. So add to those three brands of, material, brands of products and the different materials that their products are made of. We then go into the workshop where the magic happens and you add or subtract material from that to deal with the biomechanics and the flexibility of the individual's foot. And, so and that's, this is a very personal thing. And that's really key as well, that, that flexibility. The foot is a dynamic structure. We're not, you know, you, correct me if I'm wrong, please, Colin, but you aren't creating, to use the house analogy, you're not creating a solid platform for this foot to sit on. 100%. We want, we've got, what we're trying to do is reduce or stop excessive movement, but respect the foot's flexibility. You have to be able to flex your foot because that's part of how skiing happens. When you actually roll a ski onto its edge, what you're essentially doing is collapsing or pronating your foot inside the ski boot. Now, you can go back in history a little bit to the likes of Bodie Miller. Bodie never had a footbed in his boot. He hated them because he had a very flat, very flexible foot. And you'll find on the side of many, many, uh, on the, the shop wall of many American ski shops where they have all the prices for doing boot modification, there'll be a thing called the body punch. And body basically had a great big lump where his ankle bone and navicular were on the inside of the boot. And that was blown out so he could roll his foot inside the boot to create that skid drift turn that he was so famous for. That is so interesting. And I think, you know, it comes down to what you were saying um, earlier, Colin, that when someone first comes in to see you, you know, you go through their personal biomechanics, you know, looking at what is right for them. So you're able to come up with the right kind of solution <laughs> solutions for feet uh, for them. That makes that that makes a, you know, a huge amount of uh, sense. OK, I've got another question for you. Might be a bit more prosaic, but I think it's probably quite uh, relevant. Socks. There are a million different kind of socks uh, around there. Some people, you know, wear incredibly thick ski socks and some people just go for, you know, it's something that's very, very thin. What's your view? What, what sort of socks should people be taking with them when they go on their ski holiday and indeed when they go and get their uh, ski boot fitted in the first place? Okay, so the first thing we ask people to do is bring a pair of thin ski socks. I want to fit their foot into the ski boot, not half of Larry the Lamb. Because <laughs> bulk of sock is probably the single thing that can cut off your blood supply more quickly than anything else on the planet. That and doing your boots up too tight. But the idea is you want to fit the closest thing to the foot that doesn't cause compression or pain. Everybody's tolerance to compression is different. But if you start with a thin sock, when the boot packs down, and boot liners have a, uh, have a, life, a lifespan, and they pack down. So as the boot starts to get looser, you can then move to a marginally thicker sock. If you start with a thick sock and have a boot that's fitted around that, where do you go when things start to pack down? Two socks, three socks? You, you, you saw you're, you're trying to fit as close as possible without causing pain or compression. And then the material selection comes down to the physiology of the individual's foot. So we use socks that are either made of merino wool, silk, or man-made fibres, depending on the physiology of the individual. That makes sense. And Al, I think you've probably uh, written and reviewed, you know, lots of different ski socks. You know, in, in, impartially, are there any kind of uh, brands that you would recommend to listeners? I am going to take a little bit of a step back here and go, you, you, just back to your first question, you said, what do I think about at the start? What do I start with? You, What you do not start with is getting a tube ski sock. It's old school. They still exist. My leg down to my toes is not a straight line. I do not, therefore, want to fit a sock that is a straight line. I want it, a sock that's anatomical. So it's curved around my ankle. Otherwise, I get massive bunching. I don't want that in the ankle area. That's where a lot of the boot pressure is. That's where I want to be fitted. So get that out of the equation. Onto the padding bit slightly, sorry. But yeah, a thick sock might sound as though it's going to be warm, but if that compresses your foot, you're going to be cold. So it's completely the opposite. But you can get it, you know, if you get pressure in the shin, then you can get socks with thicker padding in there, their loop pile in there, and that, that can help with that. So brands, the main brands, the big brands, you know, Falky, Smartwool, 
ski brands as well. You know, there's plenty of own ski brand socks. There, there's there are yeah, there's a plethora. You know, Stance, relatively newer brand of ski socks, but I love their product. It works really well. These guys all work really hard at getting that fit, giving you cushioning where you may need it without compromising that fit of the boot. The best sock, the most expensive sock you can afford often can work really well. Don't go for like three pairs for five pounds. Yeah. So overall, then your recommendation is uh, don't use your regular rugby socks or <laughs> your, uh, your running No, they're, made, they're made differently and they're not made for that sport. Absolutely. Get the right tool for the right job. Yeah, I mean, for us, I'll, I'll throw another brand in there. Teco is probably our biggest selling sock. Uh, Falky yeah. comes next. And then we have some stuff from Lens, which is a compression sock. Uh, and Thermic as well, which make, a, make some socks which are, have got some thermal insulating properties to them, some silver in them, some uh, some sort of uh, silver mesh through, which basically helps with uh, with insulation as well. Yeah, and you Excellent. can get heated socks. If you get really cold, yeah. you can get electronic heated socks. So that all of these things are out there for you to look at. Yeah, okay. Well, you mentioned about feet getting cold, and that leads me on to some of the, the kind of technical uh, elements that you can uh, add to your ski boot, uh, let's say. Recently, I've seen about a gadget called Vpex that claims to stop your feet getting colder. I interviewed the uh, inventor uh, yesterday, as it goes, so let's just drop that interview in. Hi, I'm here today with uh, Professor Henrik Björsten, uh, who has joined us directly from Sweden. You're somewhere in the far north of Sweden. Is that right, Henrik? I am attending a meeting up north, and it actually started snowing yesterday, so I get a feel for the winter is coming here as well. Excellent. That's very exciting uh, to hear. And uh, welcome to the Ski Podcast. I wanted to have you on because um, recently I've been reading a bit about an invention of yours, which is called, or the acronym is VPEX. I wonder if you could just tell us what that stands for. What is VPEX? VPEX is uh, spelled out as Versatile Perfusion Control System. And it's a system that maintains normal blood flow in the foot when you buckle your ski boots. It uh, reduces snow pressure and also uh, gives a better fixation of the middle foot in the ski boot. Okay, but I think to me and perhaps to most people listening, the big appeal of what you're suggesting with VPEX is it's a way of stopping your feet getting cold in ski boots. That is what I hope it will do in the end. And we have done some initial testing and we see that there is a market difference between the ski, the boat with and without the VPEX system in place. So it does make a difference uh, uh, when skiing. So to be precise then, the, the VPEX is actually would, is a special type of tongue that goes within the ski boot that's been specially designed to relieve the pressure on the different nerves in the, in the upper foot. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, it's a modification of the liner, the tongue of the liner, actually. The thing is, the middle foot of ski boot is built more or less like triangle. And on top of that triangle lay, uh, runs both the dorsal pedal artery and one of the big nerves supplying sort of the nerve function to the foot. And if you have a triangle and put it in a boot, which is virtually round and drive, then buckle it, you'll get pressure points on top of the triangle and also on the side of the triangle. But those pressure will stop the blood flow running in that artery and also comp uh, compress the nerve. So with this invention, what we do is create a free flow for the artery and the nerve and thereby maintain, main, maintaining sorry, normal blood flow to the forefoot. Excellent. How, how does that work then specifically? It must be to do from what you're describing there then, the actual bottom of the, the tongue in the liner where there's contact with the top of the foot. It is. We do create a channel in the tongue of the liner. And then we also have what we call dorsal protection plates on top of the tongue of the liner that acts to protect the channel and also distribute the forces down to the side. So you get instead of a big pressure point on the top where the artery and the nerve runs, you get two pressure points on the side of this triangle. And this also shows that, of course, now all of a sudden we do have a free point fixation of the middle foot in the ski boot. And that can't be anything but good in terms of control of the ski and the ski uh, ski boot and ski interaction. So I do think it has, that's why I call it versatile, because it has many good functions. We started out with just looking at blood flow, but then we learned a lot during this process. 
And in, in terms of testing so far, what have your results shown you as to uh, you know, how, it's, how it's making a difference? We have done a blood flow or blood pressure measurement in the toes. You can actually do that where you measure the blood pressure in the toes. And then we did see that without the system, we could have a reduction of blood flow which down to or up to 80% reduction. That is 20% being left of the normal blood flow in the toes. Put the system in place, same ski boost modifications, and we had a 100% blood flow, maintained blood flow throughout. So that showed in terms of actual hard objective measurement that it preserves blood flow to the middle foot. Right, and essentially, you know, blood flow is what it's all about in terms of okay. keeping your feet uh, warm. As long as you can keep that uh, blood bump pumping around them, then it's going to keep them warm. Now, it's actually, you know, integral to the boot itself. So for this to become available to the average skier, I, am I right in thinking you need to find manufacturers who are going to, you know, integrate this into their, into their boots and into production? I see that as the quickest way to get this to the market. And I asked people and done research, and it seems to be a huge demand out there for the product. And therefore, I have contacted several ski boot manufacturers, and they are testing the technology as we are speaking. And I do hope that they are as interested as I am in the technology, so they will start manufacturing boots with this technology in place soon. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm very excited about all kind of new ideas, and we're recording this for a ski boot special, and this will be one of the the kind of future elements. I think different ways that you know ski boots can uh, can be improved, and I wish you all the best with that. And hopefully, you know, by next season, uh, there'll be an option for people to buy boots with Integral VPEX uh, in them. So that that's brilliant, uh, Henrik. Thank you so yeah. much for that. Right. And I hope it continues to snow very heavily outside. Yes, we'll get a winter, good winter season this year. Yes, nice talking to you and have a good day. So so that was interesting. We heard from uh, Professor Henrik Bjorsten there. Um, Colin, can I start with you? I think you're familiar with the VPEX uh, product. Well, what are your thoughts on that? It's, it's an interesting point. I, I understand the concept very, very well in terms of what he's trying to achieve, where the blood flow goes into the foot, because it's a, it's a fairly common problem in ski boots. It tends to be, I think, more of a problem for people that have got a boot that's a size too big because they're over-tightening that instep buckle. So key is support the foot properly. So you've got pressure from below the foot. You've got equal pressure from above. The equalizing pressures, you know, gravity and pressure and forces are great things. And if you're in the right size of boot, the foot sits in the correct place. You don't have to over tighten the shell. Uh, as for putting, I think his idea is a carbon bridge really across the tongue of the ski boot. It's, it would need to be integrated into the tongue of the boot. And that means you've got to get some ski boot suppliers on board. And these guys are notoriously don't want to spend money on patents for somebody else's product. So I, I'd be interested to see where this goes. He did mention, you know, he's trying to secure patents and, and you know, he's looking to try and find manufacturers to uh, to work with. Uh, but it'll be, uh, you know, interesting to see how that develops. You've looked at VPEX, Al? Yeah, and it, it, it's always great seeing this kind of innovation or concept or idea coming into the world because it makes people think. But going back to a point that we've spoken about a lot, you know, where a, a really good boot fitter can deal with this problem for you and solve it in other ways. So d there's not just one solution to a problem there, you know, as in all problems in life, there are different ways to deal with, with that. And a really good boot fitter will be able to solve your issue. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Another gadget um, I'm looking to use with my ski boots this winter is something called a uh, carve. And this isn't really about your boot fit in respect of improving your boot fit at all. It's about improving your skiing and being able to make sure your skiing can be as technically good as possible. Um, Al, I think you've come across the carve. I don't know if you've tested it uh, before. I wondered if you could explain what it is. Yeah. So, uh Ironically, I haven't yet skied it, although I have done presentations for their customers. So, right. um, yeah, it's a bit about around the wrong way that. But, but like you, I will be testing it this winter and seeing what it's like. They are there are two platforms: one that goes inside the hard plastic of your shell under the soft liner that you put in the boot, and within each platform, so each each you can't really call it a footbed, but 
each inset has 36 sensors in it and it can measure lots of different things pressure um they have acceler accelerometers gyroscopes in there all sorts of things now you you pay for that unit it's about 200 pounds to buy that it's then connected by a cable up to a battery pack on each boot and then there's a subscription that you pay and that could be for if you're going for a six day scheme you pay for a subscription to get coaching in that six days and that costs eight pounds and then it goes right up that is is the basic of the of, of the technology. I think like like other things, you know, 360 cameras, the technology is great, but it's the software around that that makes them really special. And that's the case with Carve. What you get when you buy into the Carve system is a whole world of coaching. I mean, recently they've signed Ted Ligerty. I mean, imagine going skiing on a hill and having that absolute legend in your ear giving you tips on how to ski <laughs> that is pretty awesome could, could be a and bit it, depressing as well <laughs> Well, and, uh, go but, faster but it, go faster yeah i mean but this point in having a having this real-time feedback in you have you know if you have a bluetooth earpiece in having this real-time feedback as you're skiing as to increase your edge angle etc that that's going to help a lot of people and it gamifies skiing. So if you go skiing in a indoor snow slope a lot, then you can take this along, really work on your skiing, and it can just add another dimension there. Will it work for everybody? Well, it's based really for piste skiing, that pressure on firm snow. So if you're about powder skiing, it's not going to work so well. And I'm never, ever going to say this will replace a ski instructor because it just it just can't. They're different systems. But they're bringing loads of new technology online. For this season, they've got video coaching where you can have a friend skiing manual videoing you. They will review that at, at, at Carve and then give you feedback. So there's huge benefits to it. There are challenges. You know, the insert is around three mil thick. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to get it and see if that will fit in my boots. As I mentioned before, I like a snug boot. Will I get a whole three mil under my foot? Well, I'll, I'll report back when I test it. So, you know, for some people, it'll work really well. For some people, it won't work. Some people, they're just not into that technology. And some people love that kind of numbers game. Ian, when I used to race a lot and I raced with you, you always went on about your numbers. You know, you love that numbers game in racing. And, um, you know, my, my wife does it quite the other way. She she raced at a high level. This is, we're talking about triathlon. And she never looked at numbers, you know, because we're all different. So it'll be interesting to see what it is. Well, it will be interesting. You mentioned the gamification side of things. So give you a score as to, like, how yeah. well you're skiing. And you can see whether you're improving. I'm slightly uh, concerned if we both have it. It's going to make me look really bad when we compare our numbers. <laughs> <Don't>, well... <laughs> It could go either way, couldn't it? We'll wait and see, but that'll be an interesting conversation. Yeah, so they have a ski, a ski IQ score, and you can build that up. There's tips to try and get to different levels, and I think they even have rewards when you get to certain levels. I mean, there's a lot going on with it, and quite a lot of the excitement around it is not the specific product itself. It's that support that in your ski. Yeah. Okay, Colin? I think I have really three very quick points on it. I think the price at the moment from off the top of my head, because I did check this the other day for a client, is three four nine, including a two year subscription. Uh they used yeah. they used to have a they used to have a, a like a lifetime subscription at the very beginning to get people to buy the product. <laughs> three four nine including two years, and then what you do after that is up to you, whether you do like you know, say six day, fourteen day, whatever, or six yeah. months or I fit absolutely one hundred percent. If a boot is fitted really snug, it's a it's a it is a challenge. We've seen a few people this year to get get it into their boots where they've had boots maybe two years ago and decided to buy a car this year. They go skiing and all of a sudden the boot hurts because three millimeters is actually quite a lot to take up in a boot. But it can be done in most cases. And if somebody knows they're going, they want to get car, talk to your boot fitter about getting it when you're getting your boots fitted. And I think the final point on the numbers is nobody knew they needed Strava before they had Strava. <laughs> That's true enough. I mean, you know, uh, these days, um, you know, Strava is my favorite social network. <laughs> I'm always like <laughs> looking at that more than uh, anything else. Cool. OK, that's really interesting. I've got two more questions for you about, uh, you know, boots uh, before we move to the close. Um how frustrating is it for you, Colin, if uh, you or one of your colleagues spends loads of time uh, trying to find the right boot for someone and then they say, well, you know what, I think that colour would go much better with my outfit? <laughs> I probably can't broadcast what I have said to people in the past. Uh, it happens very rarely. Uh, I think our, our job as a boot fitter is to educate 
and I spend a lot of awful lot of my time educating people about how boots should work. And these things are tools, not jewels. Uh, what's actually quite interesting, if you look at the wall at the moment, you look at the boot wall, it's pretty black. There's an awful lot of very dark colours out there. Interestingly, I've seen a couple of next year's boots already, and there's a little bit more colour coming into things again. But boot manufacturers have sort of realised that we kind of got to keep this fairly neutral, because a few years ago, there was some wacky stuff out there. There was some really <laughs> bright colours, and... There's some fairly horrible boot colours out there. And yeah, I get it if somebody's really offended by a, a particular colour. And I've had people come in and they go, I can't have a blue boot. Okay, I'll try and work around that. But equally, I don't choose the boot colours from the manufacturers. We don't get to choose blue, red or green. We get it's this colour and that's it. So we, and we try and put a couple of standout colours into our range so we've got that option. But they, if they don't fit you, they don't fit you. That makes sense, uh, Al. And just one thing on colour, this is looking for, because at the minute I'm looking at what brands are doing, you know, a few years down the line, and the sustainability message and story, I don't really like calling them that, because it's, it's essential that we we all get to grips with this, and ski brands really are getting in grips with it, so they're trying to use a lot more recycled materials in their boots, and once you do this, the colour options are out of the window. Yeah. Because generally, a boot that's using recycled materials is going to be black. At the moment, there isn't an option for colour in that. So, yes, there are still bright colours out there. And as Colin says, looking at stuff for next year, there are some amazing colours. But as we get further down the line, we may see, until the technology comes about where you can have colour in a recycled product, they might go a bit more muted again. Cool. That's really interesting. And Al, I've got another uh, question for you then. Do you think there are any circumstances where just buying online rather than going into the shop is the right decision to make? Listen, this is a vast world with loads of different people. And for some people, that is going to be their solution for various reasons. And yes, I'd love to sit here and go, no, you should never buy them online. I won't buy my, even as a boot fitter, I won't buy a ski boot online. I want to get it on my foot, make sure it's right. You know, generally, there are isn't just one boot that's going to work. There's a couple, but you really need to try it on. But a lot of people do, and we need to be realistic about this. People will buy it online, and then often what happens is they go to a boot fitter and get it fitted. Just appreciate when you buy it online and you think, great, it's going to cost less money. When you go to a boot fitter, they are justified in charging you a premium for fitting that product because they're not making money out of selling you that product. So you need to factor that into the price. That's really interesting. That is a fantastic uh, discussion. I've learned a huge amount about uh, boots. I should know a lot more. I should have known a lot more already, but I certainly know a lot more uh, now. Now, we're going to move towards the close. Uh, I enjoy all feedback about the show. So, uh, listener, please contact us uh, via social at the Ski Podcast or by, uh, via email to theskipodcast at gmail.com. I did uh, have uh, an email from someone who I think probably both uh, Al and Colin will know, which is Chris Exel. Uh, he yeah. said, uh, I hope you don't mind a minor correction. This is in relation to episode 101, where, uh, Al, you might remember we talked about the parablocks. Uh, although yeah. they were referred to as parablocks, they were in fact called parablacks. And the reason for that was because the inventor was called Gunter Schwarz. Uh, which means black in uh, German, and they were partly to stop skiers crossing the sharp ends, but they were widely used in World Cup speed events because they had the effect of dampening the ski and filtering out vibration. Uh, Mark had developed their own version, which had a weight suspended by springs, and it was intended as a more active suspension for ski uh, racers, uh, but it weighed a huge amount. Uh, the early ones were just plastic boxes, uh, but the last version uh, was a, a spring-loaded coat hanger wire affair which stopped your uh, tips from crossing but folded flat if you tried to uncross them sort of so that is a really detailed response there from chris yeah. and uh you know i appreciate that and i might even rename uh, that episode from para block to para blacks uh, hmm. as well a couple of other bits of feedback from different people uh Bobin CH on Snowheads uh, said uh, Gethin on Solden uh, in episode 159 was really interesting. Uh, Richard Sideways on Snowheads, uh, he uh, just said uh, uh, nice podcast as usual. He was talking about the uh, snowboard uh, episode. Uh, Elements.biz on Facebook said super interesting conversations about sustainability. That was uh, episode 160. 
Uh, Gareth Harvey also said thanks for the snowboard episode. Judy Matthews by email said, uh, really enjoying your podcast. I've only just come across it recently. I wish I had some time ago, uh, but I have plenty to catch up on when driving or running. So thanks for that, Judy. And as Judy says, there are actually over 160 episodes to catch up with. 78 were listened to in the last uh, seven days. Uh, And I would be really interested to hear uh, how you listen to the podcast, whether you're commuting or uh, in the gym or at work. And if you look at our Twitter feed, I just uh, uh, tweeted out some stats about how people listen to uh, podcasts. Now, if you do enjoy the show, uh, why not review us as it helps other people find us? We've got 88 reviews on Apple Podcasts, 74 uh, five-star reviews. And if you leave uh, a comment there, I'll read it out in the next episode. So you can uh, follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at the Ski Podcast. Uh, But for now, I'd like to thank uh, Les Trois Valets for sponsoring the show and thank my guest today, Colin. Thanks for having me on the show. And Al. Thanks, Ian. You know what? I love it. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I love having you on the show. Hopefully, listener, you found this uh, really interesting as well. So thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye.